Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the um, presidential roundtable of the Academy of Science of uh, South Africa, uh, or ASIF as we call it. Today's uh, important topic is uh, the threat of academic xenophobia <clears throat> to the future of South African universities. I see we've got a nice crowd in and growing in number. Um, and uh, we will start uh, the program in a second. What I'd like to do right now is just ask our executive officer, the famed geneticist, Professor Imla Sudiel, if she could just share a few words of welcome on behalf of the Academy. Thank you, Professor Janssen. Good morning, colleagues. And thank you very much for honoring our webinar on this very important topic. Um, the presidential roundtable is intended for us to be able to take the message of uh, uh, topics of uh, global and local interests to one and all. Uh, we also have more serious academic topics by other mechanisms, but this one is intended not only to introduce uh, academics into the room, but also the general public. And so um, it is a privilege for us to have this uh, hosted by our president. And uh, thank you to all the panelists for acceding to the invitation and joining in. And I'm sure that we're going to have an exciting discussion going forward. Um, Prof Janssen, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Himla. Um, we now have an exciting panel <clears throat> to lead us uh, on the topic of academic xenophobia. By the way, this uh, uh, particular title, academic xenophobia, is not something you would find in the literature yet. Um, and um, and yet it is such an important concept in part because we assume that xenophobia only happens on the streets of Deep Sluit or uh, the Duerans uh, and so on, but it happens also, sadly, in the halls of uh, the academy. And so, by which I mean universities. Um, and so it is very, very important for us to, uh, as a scholarly community, to anticipate these kinds of trends to speak powerfully to and against it and to shed the light. That is our role, to shed the light on things that are of importance both to campuses and community. That is why we're here today and I welcome all of you with uh, Professor Sulia very warmly to this important discussion. Uh, we have four uh, panelists to lead us. I'm going to start with Professor, uh, with Nicole Fritz, who's the director of the Helen Sussman Foundation. And she's been very helpful uh, to, to, to us, to one of my research uh, projects, which deals with academic xenophobia. And Thank you. Thanks so much for giving me this invitation um, to make the presentation. Um, and my presentation, which I will try and keep as brief as possible, is going to be fairly sort of schizophrenic. Um, one, I want to just provide a sort of overview of a matter that we have been dealing with um, at the H HSF. And then um, I wanted to just allude to uh, a matter that I think that we as South Africans um, and those in the Sub-Saharan region have to anticipate and how migration is likely to become one of the existential issues of our time. And if we don't plan properly in a principled way, it um, th will threaten to overwhelm us. So first, let me say, um, over the last year, there has been a lot of attention given to um, this matter relating to Zimbabwe exemption permits. So the Zimbabwe exemption permits are uh, the latest iteration in a series of permits that have been granted under a special dispensation regime that came into, an exist came into existence in around 2008, 2009, uh, in the wake of uh, literally hundreds of thousands of Zimbabweans fleeing into South Africa in the wake of uh, election-related violence in Zimbabwe. The first of those permits, uh, the Special Dispensation for Zimbabwe permit, was granted, uh, one, as, as a humanitarian gesture, but also very much in South Africa's interest, re recognizing that those permits <clears throat> uh, that, that South Africa's own reception systems for migrants and refugees threatened to be overwhelmed 
and also that it would be in South Africa's own security interests if those coming into South Africa were documented. And so one were able to record those numbers um, of those entering. As I have indicated, those permits, um, that, that permit was then re renewed um, in terms of the uh, Zimbabwe special permit, and then was subsequently renewed in a sense in, in, in that the Zimbabwe exemption permit was granted. And so those on this within the special dispensation regime have essentially lived, have lived in this country for now well over a decade, um, have founded uh, families, homes, careers here. Um, and in the last, uh, the Zimbabwe exemption permit was due to come to an end uh, at the end of December 2021, given, as I've indicated, that um, the, the special dispensation um, system has itself um, and yet for, for well over a decade, it um, wasn't surprising to, to anticipate that, that those Zimbabweans on the permits were hopeful and believed that, uh, that, that there would be another um, uh, permit uh, given or that there would be an extension. And during the course of 2021, there were many attempts to engage with the Department of Home Affairs in order to secure renewal. It was only in November 2021 that a decision was communicated following a cabinet decision that the Zimbabwe exemption permits would essentially be allowed to lapse and that there would be no further expiry. That decision was accompanied by a statement that there would be a grace period of 12 months within which ZDPs would be allowed to or should migrate to um, mainstream visas or apply for exception, exceptions or waivers, failing which they would have to exit South Africa. Um, it turned out that there was no legal um, premise, no legal basis for such a grace period. And so in fact, the ZDPs were then um, extended uh, until the end of this year, um, December, 2022. And then in the middle of this year, I think that the, the department realizing that uh, in order to fairly process um, or to be seen to fairly process the applications um, for visas, waivers and exemptions that were being made uh, and in order to um, manage those, it would need to extend uh, the permits yet again. And so the, the deadline is now uh, June, the end of June 2023. The HSF and several parties have sought to challenge um, the, the allowing of the lapse of the ZDP, the failure to, um, to, to, re to renew it. Um, we do so on fairly narrow grounds. We say that um, this, the decision uh, was made on the part of the department uh, with very little notice to um, Zimbabwe exemption permit holders and with absolutely no consultation, so no public participation. And we um, maintain that on this basis, the, the decision should be uh, uh, reviewed, uh, held to be unlawful and, and set aside. Our position is not that um, the special dispensation system and these permits uh, may never come to an end. It is that if, if a decision is to be made prior to any decision uh, being made, there must be widespread um, consultation. And most particularly with those who will be at the sharp end of this decision-making, the um, ZDP holders, themselves. Uh, what I should say is that um, you know, another of our concerns relating to this matter is that uh, there has been very little reason justification given for this decision. Uh, the minister has occasionally gestured to issues of criminality and unemployment and certainly um, forces within South African society who support the minister's decision have very explicitly uh, pointed to such justifications. But we know the police minister himself has said clearly that the numbers show, uh, the, the numbers of those incarcerated in our prisons, for instance, show that, that um, migrants are in fact responsible for, um, for far fewer numbers of crimes than, uh, than is proportional to their numbers in this country. And I think the absence of, of, of data, of studies, um, and respect to economic activity do not allow us to, to make any conclusions in regards to economic activity. We do not know, for instance, how many ZDP holders contribute to employment in this country. Uh, sort of general studies suggest that for every migrant, two 
uh, two jobs are created within the country, but we don't know what the figures are in respect of ZDP holders. We don't know how many are taxpayers and so contributing to um, revenue and the, uh, and the provision of public services, how many are contributing to community economies through retail, through rental, um, how many are contributing to uh, the education of children in South Africa. And so there is no way, I mean, we know very clearly that this decision is going to be absolutely detrimental and damaging to ZDP holders themselves, but we actually uh, do not know if the decision is um, net negative uh, or net positive uh, for South Africans. And our contention is in the absence of such data, uh, this type of decision making um, should, not, uh, should not be happening um, and is of of tremendous concern. I should also say um, that, that this decision has been made without um, any real planning for, for knock-on effects. And one of the situations that we are encountering now um, is that schools in the inner cities serving uh, low-income communities, but also migrant communities are, are um, in uh, deeply troubling situations. Uh, they don't know what their student cohort is going to be like for the next year and so are unable to plan. Most urgently, in fact, um, there is some question mark as to whether the South African College of Educators will be providing certificates to teachers on the Zimbabwe education, um, Zimbabwe exemption permit because uh, at present they are only lawfully authorized to be in this country until the middle of the year. Without those certificates, these schools, inner city schools, will not be able to employ those teachers who form a large part of their teaching cohort. Uh, if they do, they are in danger of losing their subsidies, which make these schools um, viable. And so again, the knock-on effects uh, are going to be um, you know, particularly grave, not only for the permit holders themselves, uh, but in fact, uh, for many uh, of the most vulnerable in our communities. Um, and so I wanted to bring that particular situation um, to your attention and put it on the table. And then in the last few minutes that are remaining, um, I just wanted to say, uh, we, um, all of us, and uh, this is an, you know, an academic audience, or the general public too, but you know, certainly um, aware of current events. We know that COP has just uh, come to an end. Um, it looks, to have been in, in, by some lights a spectacular fa uh, failure. Uh, the least developed countries have had to give up this idea of a um, uh, of limiting the world to a 1.5 degree um, centigrade uh, warming. Um, and in exchange for that have been told that uh, there is a um, landmark deal relating to loss and damage. Loss and damage pertains to any number of things um, that it's anticipated will happen as a result of the climate crisis. But one of those which is not explicitly, uh, is very often explicitly mentioned, is the coming climate migration. Uh, sub Sub-Saharan Africa as one of the global hotspots um, is anticipated to really be at the re receiving end of the worst effects of the of the climate crisis um, that is going to push huge numbers, um, displace huge, uh, huge numbers uh, and push them into migration. Uh, estimates are that by 2050, we will see 86 million Africans um, uh, migrating uh, across the continent. Obviously sort of initial steps will be sort of local um, transfer uh, migration uh, within boundaries that's going to put huge pressure on, on urban areas that are often the most fragilely positioned, least able to, to, to bear that burden. And it is going to, uh, one, potentially trigger a conflict over resources that push people across borders. Um, if the global north maintains its approach of, of building walls, of trying to shut people out, um, countries in, sub uh, in, in Southern Africa and South Africa most um, specifically are just going to be at the receiving end of um, that much um, more increased pressures to, to receive um, those fleeing and escaping climate change. 
Um, and that is unsustainable. It, I mean, already we know that the developing world uh, cannot, uh, cannot sustain uh, what, what is coming. Um, but, but with this uh, increased inflow of migration, that is going to put us, uh, place us at breaking, at breaking point. Um, there has to, if we have to plan properly, be a um, negotiation uh, as, uh, as to a global compact that ensure fairer burden sharing in terms of receiving migrants. Um, and there is no way that South Africa, which, which has to for its own, in its own interest, push for such fair burden sharing. There's no way that South Africa can compellingly do so on the international stage um, if, it is, if it itself is not able to model fair and just migration policies. Um, and I think that that is something that, particularly within universities, as we look to, to educate a, a cohort of young leaders and professionals to meet the challenges of our time, uh, that is something that we absolutely have to be giving um, huge attention to. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, very much. And <clears throat> apologies to the audience that I, uh, that ESCOM decided to take me out um, uh, in the middle of the introduction, but I, I appreciate Nicole continuing with that excellent um, uh, uh, sort of analysis and timeline of what happened when and what this might mean uh, for for the future. Um, some scary stuff in there, <clears throat> including the fact that the climate migration crisis might actually outpace our concerns at the moment with uh, the minutiae of, of, uh, um, uh, of immigrants and so on. Anyway, thank you very much. We're now going to have two stories in a row. The one uh, 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 by two colleagues whom I know and love dearly, who are themselves in different ways uh, affected by the um, academic xenophobia. The first is uh, Professor Evans uh, Kalula, who is very distinguished in the area of, of law and particularly um, uh, in uh, ILO. Uh, and he is... Um, uh, as you would see from the, the the CV we posted, somebody who has distinguished himself across the world, actually, in um, in academic law and, and academic supervision. Um, he is uh, a very dear friend. Uh, his roots are, are in, in, in Zambia, but uh, in so many ways uh, a South African uh, of, of note. And so I'm very glad that Evans will speak to us first. And then my colleague here at Stellenbosch, Dr. Precious Simba, who is one of the really, really uh, talented young scholars in uh, uh, in education, her roots are in Bulawayo, in Zimbabwe. And she does amazing work in feminist research, uh, philosophy of education, and um, and now with us, with my team, also on uh, uh, this major project on academic xenophobia. So I'm going to ask you to go in succession. I won't interrupt, starting with Professor Kalula and then Dr. Simba, and then I'll introduce uh, Professor uh, Bushlungu. Uh, Evans, over to you. Uh, you'll have to unmute, Evans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, I was saying. Uh, my fellow panelists, colleagues and friends who are following this round table, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning, good. Prof. Uh, sorry to, if you can just adjust your camera. Your face seems to be deep in there. Just come up, come up a bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm coming. You, you, you know, I'm... <laughs> As I keep saying, I'm BBC born before computers. I have no <laughs> idea. I was set up. <laughs> I don't know. Does does that help? Can does, I? Does, can uh, it helps yeah, a bit. Can you just bit. yeah? Can you just tilt your 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 the okay. top screen? There you yes. go. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank thank, thank you, you sir. Prof. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's uh, please allow me, uh, uh, Professor Janssen, uh, to greet, first of all, to greet an old friend, 
and a kindred spirit. We go back a long way. I've not seen him for some time. And that is the Vice Chancellor, Professor Sakela Burongo. Sakela, I'm delighted that you're back in the trenches and I, I wish you well. It's, uh, it's not a, uh, a sort of uh, a pleasant park, as you know. And incidentally, Sakela, I'm still waiting uh, for, uh, you know, for your, the invitation you threatened to give me to come and visit uh, Fort Hare. I'm looking forward to that. Now, let me at, at the outset start by saying what a privilege it has been for me to spend 30 years in South Africa. In fact, most of my working life. South Africa has given me not only the opportunity and space to realize my academic pretensions such as they are, but equally important, an opportunity to make a modest contribution in the growing of what he, one Dr. Mampela Rampele once said, the, the growing of future timber. Above all, my gratitude to South Africa is that it has literally uh, given me a new lease of life. Having had, had been lucky to, to have a heart transplant 10 years ago. So as I speak, I've got a South African a woman's heart, may I, I so rest in a ten of peace, uh, beating in me. So South Africa has get, uh, kept me alive. Uh, I was never an economic refugee. In fact, whenever I felt sorry uh, for myself at UCT, I used to think I was in, in relatively pleasant, but reduced circumstances. But that's not the point. The, the point I'm, I'm trying to make out here is that uh, to answer the question is the uh, South African universities at risk in terms of academic uh, xenophobia. And the, my answer would definitely be yes. Uh, I can honestly say and sincerely say there isn't enough time for me to to go into the details of my personal experience that I have uh, experienced encountered hostility more than resentment about amounting to uh, xenophobia from colleagues and much more disturbing uh, from some of my my line managers along the way uh, and that I think is is unfortunate. Uh, I should do hasten to add that uh, one of the greatest kind of uh, you know uh, experiences I've I've enjoyed is uh, from students across the races, across nationalities, and the particularly black students. Uh, they have been an incredible. Uh, they have been incredible in their affirmation of my presence not least on account, uh, and this is obvious from my experience, that they saw in me a role model, particularly in an area where for some reason, it was always thought that, you know, uh, in spite of the many lawyers, both even in the colonial, uh, uh, you know, Portuguese territories, that, you know, Africans, Blacks, uh, generally would, would not, wouldn't cut it in law. So that I think uh, for me has been a great, uh, a great kind of sort of uh, experience. Now, let me make it very clear that the resentment against foreigners and preference for nationals is the norm everywhere, not least in African countries. I come from a country that was always hosted refugees and exiles long before more than uh, 70 years when I was born, uh, Northern Rhodesia then was always a haven for refugees. But even there, there are flaps now and again. The difference is the extent to which leadership checks them, the extent to which they are not allowed to impinge on the, uh, the, you know, the clear as a, uh, benefits uh, that 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 the foreign nationals, particularly academics, bring. I when I went to university, uh, uh, you know, at my first uh, alma mater, uh, it was a haven 
of foreign academics. I was taught by Nigerians, uh, you know, uh, Ugandans, and yes, South Africans as well. I mean, uh, that's the, the time I was blessed to meet uh, people like Ben Turok, uh, Esakiam, Esakiam Pahere. Uh, you, we knew him then as the Ezekiel before he, he reclaimed his authenticity. He taught me. Uh, we had the, uh, uh, my other teachers in secondary schools were, you know, John Samuels. We had Reggie September, not the Reggie September that you who was the one that was in exile. And the, even Louis Nkosi, you know, sort of, who, uh, you know, sort of stayed in Zambia, in, even after the, uh, the the transformation here. So Zambia benefited from the presence of these academics. And okay, we benefited from a conflict basically because these were exiles, not only from South Africa, from but from Biaf Biafra and then also Idi Amin is the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, crisis that was uh, created in uh, in, in Uganda. Now, the, 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 during this uh, festive uh, formative years, I keep, I'm sorry, I, I fumble as you know, it, it was, the country benefited from it. The leadership, in spite of the, the accession from time to time, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being swamped, and I know, that this feeling is not without basis. That you know, you here you are in South Africa struggling to transform, and you, I think uh, Sakela will tell you because he has in in the past uh, told me that you know somehow there is something not right if you have a university that has got um, you know your own people are not really sort of a presence, and the, that. But in spite of that, uh, you know, sort of feeling, which is real, uh, there, is a, there is a difference between that feeling, uh, observing reality, and what you need to do about it. Uh, and the simply resenting and sort of uh, blaming the, you know, the foreign academics, particularly, uh, you know, African academics as being responsible uh, for, 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 your, for your problems. I was uh, privileged to go to university, and you yourself, uh, Mr. President, Professor Janssen, you have observed at a time when many universities in Africa, the mighty Badan, Makerere, Dar es Salaam, the University of Rhodesia, these were university colleges of London. But you look at them now, and you have said that before quite rightly, they are shadows of themselves. There isn't much happening there in, in, in terms of what. So the idea is that, you know, sort of, uh, uh, I was never an economic refugee here, as I said, you know, sort of, but I sought a space that exists, exists in South Africa in terms of the intellectual uh, space in a democratic kind of uh, country that, that uh, you know, allowed me to realize the, the few, the, the little potential I had as an academic. And uh, a lot of uh, Africans, as we speak, uh, you know, I, I think you have also spoken to this, uh, are abroad, they are in diaspora. In fact, uh, one of the vice chancellors, uh, you know, he, uh, he, in South Africa once went to a foundation and said, look, we, you supposedly come out to Africa to help us. You get, you give scholarships to these people. They go uh, abroad and they never come back. In fact, you are training them for themselves. And my, my argument is that uh, it makes sense for these people to come to South Africa because South Africa, and in spite of what you have rightly said, Professor Janssen, you know, in your book, I've got your book, he as, uh, as I talk by fire, is uh, facing uh, terrible, terrible problems. Uh, they, I understand your despair and I hope 
it, you are not right. I hope you are wrong. But despite that, South Africa still has universities that are world class. Universities, I think, that allow for that space. Universities that that sort of uh, uh, sort of good good sources of the generation of knowledge. My old friend and colleague Danny Fisa always tells me of the story of the University of Malaysia and the University of Singapore. Uh, you know, when when they broke up uh, as countries, University of Malaysia said, "No, we are not going to have." Uh, we are, you know, foreigners are not welcome here. They, we are going to develop our own people. And, and uh, Singapore was open in terms of the universities. You compare the two universities now, you hardly hear of the University of, uh, of Malaysia. Singapore is among the best universities. The point I'm trying to make, uh, Mr. President, is that the, this opening up of universities does not only allow for the infusion and the sort of the best uh, generation of knowledge, least of all from the continent, it would allow a lot of uh, you know, these academics to remain in Africa. Uh, my own country, which by far is not sort of the greatest producer of academics, there are more Zambian professors in Ivy League universities in the, in the States, not to mention South Africa. Look at the university, um, I'm sort of um, um, I'm attached to the there are Zimbabwean, Zambian, and other African professors. Uh, the they sort of they they applying their trade, uh, so to speak, in the in in the interests of South Africa. I have been part of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that group for thirty years at UCT. Now should. African academics come to South Africa. Would I come to South Africa if I had to do it over, all over again? Yes, I would. The uh, Af foreign African academics should come to South Africa. Uh, but mindful of the fact that when they come to South Africa, they should not play the card of being more native than the native. One has got to understand the South African complex history you South Africans are very angry people. You are angry against each other. You are angry against foreigners. And the, even one sort of uh, politician in his uh, you know, lucid moments characterized this xenophobia as being self-hate. That somehow you don't, you, 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 know, you can't see it. That this, this kind of hostility that explores uh, you know, even untouches universities is self-destructive. These are real problems. The anger that you people bear for what the for the dream that you see as not having been lost is real. But turning it against yourselves and 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 people who can contribute, no matter how little, to to finding solutions is not the answer. So yes, academics, foreign African academics must come here. And they must come here realizing that every country has got preferences, that South Africa has got a right to develop its own people and they must help in that mission. They must be part of, of that mission as prescribed. It's not about taking over. It's not about being substitutes for, for South Africa. For the most of my time at UCT, uh, Professor Janssen, I was a pair of safe hands, dragged into every, every committee. I sat on every committee you can imagine. Executive uh, Committee of Council, Council, you know, Senate Executive, you name it. Every day was, whenever they wanted a white, you know, a black face, I was pushed. Okay, I went, I went along, not because I, I did not know what was happening, but in the interest of, you know, sort of uh, dealing with this prejudice that blacks are not up, are up to it, that I would somehow serve as a little kind of role model. And that's what I've so, I sought to do. So my sense, uh, Mr. President, is that uh, the academic 
xenophobia in academic circles is real. It's not, and we need to tackle it. You need to tackle it in the interest of South Africa itself. The incidentally, the argument that is made not only in the academia, but elsewhere, that you know, sort of uh, African migrants uh, are entitled to be here because the, uh, you know, South Africans were helped uh, in exile, or they were part of the struggle. That is nonsense. It doesn't wash. It doesn't wash. Every country has got uh, preferences in terms of uh, focusing on its, uh, on its citizens. It must push that. You, in any case, if, if these Africans are really true to themselves, what they did in joining the cause of struggle, and it was not only South Africa, by the way, Mr. President, uh, Mozambique, and Angola and Zimbabwe as well benefited from the, this push. They did it, one would like to think, out of conviction to liberate Africa politically. And the, 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 there are people who said, you know, it was out of uh, South African, Pan African, uh, Pan African solidarity that you need to do that. So that argument for me doesn't work. So, uh, Professor Janssen, and the colleagues and friends, it's been a pleasure for me to be part of this journey, to play a small part. It's really, it's really gratifying to see that over the, the last 30 years I've been contributed to the training of leading practitioners, you know, judges on all, all benches of the, the South African uh, judiciary, not to mention, you know, sort of even for Europe as, as, as it happens, uh, you know, and China, I've been able to be part of that, but what really appeals to me and makes me very gratified is the fact that I've made, uh, you know, a little contribution, a modest contribution into uh, the, the growing of future team. And who says that the beautiful ones are not yet born? They are, they are here. I mean, sort of, there is, uh, Sakea is one of them. Not to mention, you know, he, deans and you know heads of departments. I've been lucky to be part of the, the development of some of those. So the beautiful ones are born. Uh, they are not always born. They are, they are here. They are not waiting to be born. So right. uh, I'm, I'm, I'll stop there, Mr. President. Uh, but you. as the Stanley Samkange, my favorite no novelist who wrote on trial for my country would say, I'm glad I stopped here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Precious. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Prof, for, for those words. And I think I will um, point to some of the things that you raised. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. I will speak briefly, and I've just put a timer on the side here. After all, I'm a teacher and we can get going um, quite a bit. So I will speak briefly about the threat of academic um, xenophobia from the perspective of academic citizenship, community and belonging. So what I did in preparation for this talk is I went to the websites of about 15 universities in South Africa, public universities, and I looked at how they describe themselves and position, position themselves as universities. And it's interesting that 14 of the 15 universities see themselves as African institutions in a global world. So from UCT, Fort Hare, Nelson Mandela, uh, these institutions imagine themselves as African institutions first, not South African institutions. And I found that very interesting. For example, um, the UCT um, VC on the website notes that um, their vision, the UCT's vision is to be, and I quote here, an inclusive research intensive African university that addresses the challenges of our time. I think that is very meaningful. And Nelson Mandela, um, they state that they are a dynamic African institution. So we see that these universities across South Africa continue to position themselves on the global knowledge market as African institutions. And yet when we step into their day-to-day -day operations of the same institutions, there's a concerted effort to push out African foreign national academics. And as such, one begins to wonder, right, 
about this disconnect between the surnaming of themselves, they're naming themselves as African on the global market in one place, and then making uh, the space hostile and unwelcoming for African foreign nationals in the local. So it's almost as if that surnaming, um, there is some hypocrisy that lies there. I would like to look at this issue, like I said, from the perspective of academic citizenship, and maybe at the end share um, a brief story on um, the issue of allyship and pointing towards belonging. It is important to note that their experiences in broader society, when we're talking about xenophobia, for example, the experiences that we've come to know and narratives that have dominated broader society. And then their experiences inside the academy, inside this knowledge community. And I think these two need to be separated. So I, I liked Nicole's presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, and the timeline that she was giving us and the experiences um, the current issues that are going on with um, the battle against the ZTP, um, for example. But I think inside the academy, there's always been a sense of this is a safe zone. This is a community, a sort of a, a utopia that holds itself to a different set of standards. However, when we start to talk about xenophobia within this community, I think then our antennas should be on high alert. Because then we start to ask ourselves what is happening to this utopia because the university has always been pitted as a space for the social reproduction of, a, of an imagined society, what we want society to be like. But when this space then is tainted with narratives of xenophobia and xenophobic experiences, then we must start to imagine something else, right? And I think this is where academic citizenship then needs to come in. Now, much like many concepts, um, academic citizenship in its own is contested, and I won't go into those contestations. Um, for some people, they talk about it as a duty, right? Um, the duty that one must execute by being a member of, an esteemed member of a community of knowledge seekers. Um, but for others, and myself included, I see it not as a duty, but a set of virtues, academic citizenship that one must orient themselves towards in order to take up membership in this esteemed community. And I continue to see it as an esteemed community because society at large looks at the university in a particular way, right? So regardless of what interpretation tickles your fancy, there's no esca escaping that the university is an imagined community. And like all communities, it must be imagined and performed in order to exist. And I'm quoting here, um, Professor Felt, um, Ulrike Felt. So there is a, a dual process that must happen when we're thinking about the university. It must be imagined, right? And clearly from the statements that I saw online up from these 15 universities, there is a type of imagination, a type of branding, a type of positioning that these universities are giving themselves. But it must also be performed and this is where we're having the challenge because in terms of how the university is performed, it is performed in high, it's starting to be uh, performed in highly exclusionary patterns. And these exclusionary patterns, of course, South Africa being South Africa and its history, we know of the racialized past of um, the country, which was also, um, which also seeped into the university. But now these exclusionary patterns are showing themselves in other ways, in xenophobic and Afrophobic ways. So what does this disconnect between the imagined um, university and the performed university, which is exclusionary, what does it mean for South Africa and South African universities? Well, I think there is a sort of isolation that South Africa um, is in danger of. And Professor uh, Eversens can really has just alluded to that. There's a sort of isolation that um, uh, it is building itself towards, right? How can these institutions that are somewhat aware of the Africanness be duly hostile to the entrance of Africa in its halls? And I reckon that there are many reasons for this. But some of them um, I would like to think is the making of a better black 
and the hierarchization of black bodies. And I, I mean black here in terms of Steve Biko black. So one of the um, experiences that I had when I first came to Stellenbosch was a gentleman who told me, welcome to the last colony, which was very disconcerting. And then um, after talking a little bit, he was an Uber driver, a white male Uber driver. And after a while, he's, he said, no, you sound different. You're not like that other, the other ones that we know here. And he was like almost alluding to that I am some sort of better black. And I feel like what is happening within the university is um, the transformation of transformation, where transformation begins to mean um, the inclusion of certain types of bodies within the university. But even in that inclusion, um, there is a better black or a preferred black um, that the labor policies or employment equity prefers. And by so doing, we start seeing the pushing out um, or ring fencing of the South African University, excluding African foreign nationals. Whilst I think when Prof, Prof Kaluda first came to South Africa, it was a different story. Um, it was far much easier, I believe then, <clears throat> for um, academics from, from, uh, from, Afri from the African continent to come here. But now with um, different institutions, policies within the university, the work of the home affairs, for example, it is becoming almost impossible for foreign um, African foreign nationals to come and um, execute their duties here um, and execute their membership within the academy here in South Africa. And that, that has serious ramifications. Um, I see my time is almost, almost gone here. Um, Maybe I can just skip to the last bit where I was going to talk about, I would have explained more about the ramification, what it means, this ring fencing and the pushing out of um, African foreign nationals. But I'd like to share, um, sorry, let me stop this. I'd like to share a little bit <clears throat> and draw from my own experience in my own department as a foreign national where I have been shown a level of humanity that renews my hope for the South African University. And here I would like to specifically speak of allyship as activism and an ethics of hospitality. What I see a lot of times is, even though um, national politics overlap into the day-to-day -day of what the university has to do, I think what makes it even more difficult for African foreign nationals is when those sentiments are carried over by our colleagues and they are reiterated within um, the halls of the university. A lot of the times these sentiments are not carried by our students. Our students come to our halls with an openness of learning and um, they do know that at the end of the day, I'm the one who has to mark the assignments. So, you know, there is a kind of collegiality between our students. But our colleagues, I think, should carry a heavier mental of creating space for African foreign nationals in terms of allyship, in terms of hospitality, in terms of activism that pushes for the university to make better policies, especially in how um, new academics are employed. Because when growing our own timber is now being translated into South Africa first and everyone next, then there is a problem there. And when our South African uh, academics within the university accept those narratives without questioning them, then they also too become complicit within the very fabric that is making sure that they are ring fencing um, the academic space. And so I think the greater mantle falls upon um, our colleagues within the university to challenge these policies and also to create space through an ethics of hospitality that allows for uh, different experiences, different ideas, different accents, different skin tones, different kinds of black, different kinds of academics, not just black, 
from the African continent to find space within the South African University. And I, I believe I'm hopeful of this because I have seen it executed within my own department from the time that I joined as a PhD student, I think from my supervisor, the kind of support that they would give in order for me to thrive here, to the support that I'm getting as an academic, a young academic here to make sure that my experience is my voice and the knowledge that I bring has space um, to thrive and grow. And um, I feel when more of that is done, then I feel there is a practice of an ethics of hospitality. And I feel that is needed more. As much as we are critical um, together with Nicole and I support the work that they do, we are very critical of how the Department of Home Affairs, for example, is executing its duty. We're very critical of that. And there are legal pathways to, um, I think, challenging those channels. But the things that I think make it even more um, uh, hostile is when the environment does not allow for African foreign nationals to feel like they belong within the South African academia. And I think that is um, a mantle that um, South African, our South African colleagues can carry. I've seen it happen. It is possible, but it has to be a deliberate action towards um, an ethics of hospitality. I think I will end there, Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And what a lovely turn of phrase and ethics of hospitality. It gives one a sense of what can happen uh, if we get our, uh, you know, our politics right in this regard, our humanity right. Thank you so much, Precious. Um, now I'm delighted to, to, to invite Professor Sakele Bushlungu, the Vice Chancellor of the University of, the, of Fort A. I almost said Free State, sorry, Sakele. <laughs> and, um, and Sakela is, in addition to being an outstanding uh, manager uh, and leader of his institution, he is also, in my book, one of the few really intellectual vice chancellors in our country who has achieved so much in his study of labor unions, uh, for example, which if you haven't read it, your life is, is incomplete. But the reason I wanted to ask Prof. Schlunger is because the University of Fort Hare and particularly other rural universities tends to uh, attract uh, uh, academics, particularly African academics from other countries uh, who uh, to, to, to do important work that uh, many South Africans don't necessarily you know, do in terms of a, a Fort Hill or Limpopo or, uh, uh, you know, a vendor, sorry, uh, and, and so on. So I am very excited to ask Prof. Bishlungu to give us a vice chancellor perspective on this problem. <laughs> you are raising uh, uh, hopes uh, here, uh, uh, Professor Janssen. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me and greetings to my fellow pa panelists. And uh, Again, it's good to, to meet some old friends. Um, Professor um, Kalola, uh, yes, we did time together at uh, in many places, I, I won't say, including UCT. It, it very kind of him to say the beautiful, to include me among the beautiful ones, but uh, that's a topic for another time. I, I'm going to be very brief and I'm going to speak about my institution and um, I don't do this often. I don't talk about my institution often in, or on platforms outside the institution. I talk to, 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 about, about it to my own, uh, to my own uh, people and colleagues. Now, let me start by just very briefly, a very brief uh, uh, kind of experience. On, in 2005, I was uh, in the US on a fellowship uh, for six months. Uh, with the five colleges program, and I was hosted by the university, by UMass, University of Massachusetts in, uh, in Amherst. And um, one of the things I picked up during that stay was attention under the surface, but very, very, very close to the surface between African-Americans on the one side and Africans uh, uh, on, on the other, African academics, from the rest of the continent who are doing work, who have academic uh, appointments there. It, it, it was never expressed publicly, but whenever you had an opportunity uh, to, to listen carefully and be in a private uh, and, or even social space, you'd feel the tension. It would be expressed and articulated. So I just thought I, that told me something 
in a way, it also taught me uh, further down the line where I stand now about the delicate nature of that relationship between uh, foreign nationals on the one side and locals on the other. But foreign locals who have come out of a particular experience of um, oppression and, 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 um, and denial of access to resources, including intellectual resources. So I just thought I'll, I'll put, put that there and that's my, that experience in very ways, in, in perceptible ways, uh, taught me a few things that have come to guide me, my thinking, uh, when I landed uh, in, in other institutions. I will not talk about my time at UCT. Um, that's another. That's for another day. But um, just, let, let me let me just talk about this local stroke foreign kind of dynamic at UFH. I arrived here in 2017, and uh, of course, um, the, 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 there was a huge number of uh, foreign nationals, foreign scholars, uh, 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 international scholars at, at, at UFH, and um, even as I entered friends, comrades, colleagues, whatever, acquaintances, were trying to lobby me to fix this problem because there are too many foreigners here and they're blocking spaces for, for, for locals. And so I listened and listened and listened. And then of course, I then used, I, I, then I looked and I looked and I looked and I listened once, once more. And I thought to myself, no, it can't be that simple. It cannot be that simple. Again, you know, there were echoes right there of my, my kind of observation of the, the African-Americans and Africans in the US. But, but anyway, let me, let me start by saying, because in all the former black universities, there was a time in, in history, there was a time particularly after 1994, when I'm going to say we for locals, right? When the locals, um, Basically, they left the academy. They went into the civil service and politics in large numbers. There was this kind of big hemorrhage of local uh, academics and local scholars and administrators for, for that matter. And in my institution, Professor Bengo is the first example I would give. He was the vice chancellor here for hardly two years. And then he went, he went up to become the minister of education. But he was followed by many in, in, in many people in the ranks, academics and researchers and so on. What that did already, something which was already a trend, he then opened the vacuum. And then let me use another we. Then those of us, and that includes me in a very direct sense, those of us were sitting pretty, well, maybe not so pretty, but sitting at UCT, at VETS, I was at VETS at the time and so on. And we would look at Forte and it would be far and it would be the place that you, you never even consider as a place of employment. And so we therefore created that vacuum by first running for the positions in politics and, and the public service and business or sitting around in, in, that's in these other institutions. So obviously that vacuum was filled by uh, African scholars. In, in, in large numbers, it was filled, and I'm not saying it started in 1994, but I'm making, this is a big moment. And they, they, they did, and they did a, a great service to the country. They did a great service to higher education and so on. So as I was entering Fort Hare, and I'm looking at these people trying to lobby me to take action, push them out. And so I'm saying, but, but you got, you, you, no, not so fast, not so easy. You can't, you can't do that. It's a silly and, and, and uh, it's a silly, a, a, a nonsensical uh, a populist kind of stance. And I'm not, I don't go for those things. Okay, so I, I'm just saying therefore, when I entered Forte and I found this large number of foreign nationals, uh, especially in, in academia as, as academics and researchers, for me, it, it makes sense. I, I, it makes sense, it was no surprise and it was not a problem in itself. In itself. It was not a problem in itself, right? So. That's that's why that's how I've I've come to, to do this, and therefore, that thing of push them out, that thing of send them back home, send them to the airport to to to, to be flown back home. It was never it never it never entered my my thinking as a way to deal with this issue. Yes, I was concerned that they were, the 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 number of South Africans was 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 very small, especially young black South Africans especially black women South Africans. 
it, it's still the case now. So what's the point then? Do you then say, you, you are from Zimbabwe, get out. I'm going to put a young black woman? No, no, doesn't work like that. What, what you, de- you do, you value the scholars that you have for their own sake as scholars, as researchers, as people who contribute to the uh, academic enterprise, the research enterprise. And what you do then, you manage what I call here a very delicate balancing act. My job is that. Now, before I come to speaking a little bit about that delicate balancing act and how we manage it or one should manage it uh, in, in the position that I occupy, is this. I very often, very often when we talk about the foreign scholars and, and, and local scholars, especially, I will come to administration. It's not, it's not, that's not where the, the big issue is. We often talk about it uh, as, as you know, either this side or the problem is on that side. Frankly, the problem is on both sides. The problem is on both sides. To what degree, I'm not going to venture there, but the problem is on both sides. Common sense notions of foreigners by South African people generally. Is, is that they blame them, they, they, bring, they, they bring stereotypes, they bring all sorts of other things. They blame them for things that they've never done. They, they often blame them for things that they've never, they've never experienced themselves in, 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 in firsthand. And so you have that thing. You accuse them of everything. Everything that's wrong, you associate without any shred of evidence, without any shred of proof. You just kind of stereotype these people as a category. And that, that's common, that's common. I mean, one, I was meeting with one person uh, last week, a uh, person in, in, as, as an academic, and they were coming and they complained about, yay, there are many Zimbabweans here. Some people where I live, they call us a little Zimbabwe. Okay, so that's, that's how, and so I feel this thing, I get told this thing, I get lobbied to, to think and to act in particular ways. And those are, that, that's what South Africans do. So there's always that tension. There's always that tension from the local side, okay? It's resentment. It's, it's, it's a resentment because of uh, whatever. You can call it all sorts of things. You can call it xenophobia if you like. I, I don't particularly subscribe to that. I, I think it's, it's a very simplistic way of understanding it, of understanding the phenomenon. But you can call it resentment over positions and, and, and resources, access to resources and so on. So that's the one side. That's the, the, the dynamic. But there are also common sense notions among the, the, the foreign or international scholars too, and international people working in the academy too. There, there, there is a sense it gets expressed uh, quite, quite often. We nearly had a terrible, terrible uh, flare up amongst our students. Um, and this one student on social media, a post-grad student writes that you South Africans, you, 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 you give birth at age 14 and so on and so forth, and then, we, we are here, I'm a Zimbabwean, I'm going to get, I'm going to get your money, the bursary money, and I'm going to get, and I'm going to rule over you, and eventually I will employ you. It caused a big stir. It had to be managed. Thank goodness. It had to be managed. And that, that person was reprimanded by all, including uh, people from their country. So there are all those things. When I got here, one of the things I asked uh, the, the, uh, then uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, I said, well, so, so why is it that at graduation, there's a predominance of foreign nationals, uh, especially for PhDs, about 80%, 80%, okay? I said, now South Africans, you know, after their first degree, they want to go out because they want to buy a BMW. I said, nonsense, you're talking nonsense. And then, and then he says also that we can't attract them because they don't want to come. I said, nonsense, I'm from UCT. There's a buzz, a buzzing kind of number and dynamic by black postgraduate students. What's your problem? So there, there are all of those things. There's all of, uh, some of them saying we are better educated, we're the better system of education, all of these kind of stereotypical, stereotypical things. So they come from both sides. Now, my approach has always been this. I, I, don't, I, don't, like, I don't like stereotypes. I don't work with stereotypes. I don't want, I don't like, you know, zero sum kind of uh, kind of approaches to things, either black or white. No, it can be gray. You know, it can be, it can be any other color, actually. It can be other than black and white. So my approach has always been then that, um, oh, let, let me tell you the story. There are the two senior appointments. One was basically not renewing a, de- a deputy vice chancellor's contract, and there happened to be a foreign national. 
And um, I tell you, he started mobilizing, he started spreading the rumor, this VC is, is, is xenophobic and so on and so forth. And before he knew it, there was this kind of swirling kind of rumor mill uh, uh, about, about this. I, look, I decided I'm not gonna deal with that thing. People can tell the, the truth. The other one, which tells the, the, the opposite story, is that at the height of the governance meltdown in the university, I appoint, appointed on, a, on an acting basis and a registrar who is a foreign national. And he, he did an ex excellent job. One of the reasons we pulled through at that time was because of him. And it's not because of his foreignness, but because of his integrity, because of his firmness, because of his principled approach to administration. Now, it is a fact, I've made the point, that um, it, uh, it's improving now, it's improved dramatically, that the majority of our postgraduates, especially uh, PhDs, about, it's now about maybe 65% uh, are foreign nationals. I need to also mention this, this point, that when we're talking about foreign nationals at, at UFH, uh, scholars and students and all of that, and administrators, we're talking about two countries, essentially. We're talking about Zimbabwe, and we're talking about Nigeria. And one of the things I've always said to people is instead of kind of you uh, whinging and whining about uh, foreigners and so on, you need to spread the, the base. We need to have Ethiopians. We need to have people from Egypt. We need to have people from Ghana. We need to have people from Lesotho. That's what we need to do. But let's get the best from across the continent. Let's stop this thing of these two countries the people from these two countries who then fetch post postdocs and postgrads from their own country and which shows up at graduation as an imbalance. Now, as I, as I conclude, there are two things I want to say. It is a delicate balancing act. And my approach has, has been exactly that. And, I, and, and now, and I'm, I'm now finishing, towards finishing my sixth year here, that I still have departments that are 100% foreign national. I am, and my approach has always been a, a pragmatic one. The quest, first question is, do they add value? If they add value, then you must have an incremental process of then having that transition. And then find, find and you're not just going to find another mediocre black uh, academic. You must find the, 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 a top one. And we have them in the country. Go and find them and recruit them and, and find a way of transitioning. So it's a delicate thing. And where I sit, therefore, I can't be for this. I can't be, therefore, climb on the bandwagon of locals who want to chase uh, foreign nationals out. And likewise, I know for, the foreign nationals had a lot of value, but there's some of them also who are very dodgy. We had a major uh, 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 thing uh, uh, last year where we had a foreign national that basically we ejected, who was doing all sorts of, of, of funny things. And the case is, 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 is still with the courts and he is being uh, dealt with by, by the Hawks and, and so on and so forth. Now, as a last thing, the issue of academics and this issue of xenophobia, it cannot be, and, and this is, for me, that's been my disappointment with these debates. It's always seen as a black on black, black local, black uh, uh, foreign or rest of Africa kind of person. And my, my question always is, what about white people? Is it possible to understand these relations between foreign, foreigners and locals outside of the fact that we have white people? And my view is not. And what we need to interrogate in addition, not, uh, not in replacement of, but in addition to understanding this very uh, fractured and fragile relations between local and, and so on in higher education, we need, we need to look at what role what role do white people play? White people in administration and white, white people in, in the academic enterprise uh, and research enterprise. So for me, these are complex issues. And, and therefore, as I say, at Port Head, I can assure you now, we're not gonna have a blow up or flare up about white uh, foreign nationals are being kicked out and so on and so forth. Some of our best uh, research producers are foreign nationals. And we respect them, we celebrate them, we, they, we, we hold them in extremely high regard. We also have top performers who are locals. Those locals who are into others and other business and mischief, we, we deal with them separately. 
Those foreign nationals who are up to mischief, we deal them separately and outside, and we don't announce, we don't call press conferences. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Jansen. Thank you. And thanks to the panel. Wow. That was stimulating. I, you, you, in addition to an ethics of hospitality from Precious, you gave me my other favorite quote uh, regarding an appointment in the registrar's office, if I understood it. The, the, the problem was not his foreignness, but his integrity. My God, what a beautiful way of putting it. Um, right. Thank you. We have a lot of questions, and, and I'm just going to start with the ones that I've taken down from the chat. Nicole, could I start with you, if you could show your face? Um, uh, one of the questions is, what about permanent residence holders? Can they also be targeted in a university's equity and promotion policies? I don't know if you, if you can speak to that, but yeah. I, I'm sorry, Professor Janssen, I actually, I, I don't, I don't know enough to be able to give any illuminating answer to, to okay. that. Okay, thanks, so. Nicole. Uh, Sakela, can you, do? is there a different uh, standard, for example, in how you would deal at Fort Air with somebody who is a permanent residence holder versus, for example, somebody who's still on a short-term immigration uh, appointment? Okay, let, let me, let me put it this way. By the way, just, you know, one of the things I had to, wrap my head around very quickly when I landed this side is the fact that at Port Head transformation means something entirely different to the institutions where I'd work. That's UJ, Pretoria, UCT. Here, basically, it's very rare to find white people. Um, and so when, um, when it comes to employment equity and, and so on, that, that we want to diversify the pool more have more white people, more Indian people, and so on and so forth. That's the challenge. Now, let me come to the issue of, of, of permanent residence. For us, look, what, what, what we do, what we do, and we've, I, I don't remember a situation where this was a, a burning issue. I only know that when we make appointments, we make them on the basis of equity, rather, of, 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 um, of people's profile that meet, people meet the criteria and therefore, and, and I know many permanent resident, residents who are here, who are in permanent academic appointments. Some of them are in my, in my administration. Now, take, 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 take this example, for example, in my executive team of uh, seven people, the CFO is a, is a foreign national. And, and for me, it's, it's whether he's a permanent resident or he's a foreign national, he's not fixed term contract like myself, and, uh, and 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 that's what it is. So it, it's not an issue that has confronted us to the same extent as it would the other institutions, where you have to choose between a Zimbabwean and, and a South African and a white person and a colored. No, it doesn't affect us in that way. Thanks very much. Yeah, Nicole, can I come back to you? I, I, I was thinking while you were presenting that. None of these, uh, I'm going to take you a little bit out of the law into, you know, I suppose social science thinking more broadly. Um, would you agree that it is impossible for this to be a problem, academic cemetery on campuses or in communities, without there being either, um, you know, calculated neglect, if not direct provocation by the political classes? I, I do think it's it's certainly again and and obviously my knowledge and experiences is drawn from a, a context outside the the academic one um, specifically. But I think it's not only a case of kind of neglect on the part of uh, our political leaders, but often I, I think um, a case of uh, deliberate uh, manipulation and and I you know refer to to one example. So in the papers that we've exchanged with uh, the the department and the minister in respect of our ZDP um, matter, the uh, the minister has said that um, has pointed um, time and again to the fact that his decision in fact should not be subject to criticism or challenge because it, it um, has received wide support and acclaim from uh, 
South Africans themselves. And he then points, which is ironic, right? Because our challenge is that in fact, there's been no real public participation, not just with ZDP holders, but in fact, with, with other stakeholders. He then points to and, and, and attaches to his papers, sort of sentiments that have been shared on Twitter um, as, uh, as oh. supposedly evidence and, and documentation of the support um, that that he has obtained and you know even those of us without sort of expertise as to social media know the extent to which it can be inflamed used irresponsibly manipulated and it um, seemed to me uh, um, you know in this small sense only uh, a demonstration that it wasn't just sort of negligent but in fact our our, you know, political leaders are often sort of pointing to the most extremist um, elements within within our society in order to to secure support um, support and justification for their actions. And I think that that is is enormously um, concerning. Can I just say, I mean, just in respect, uh, one of the other things that I I wanted to just um, point to, and it's anecdotal. Um, and again, outside the academic context, but this idea of um, the the particular role that um, that uh, whites and I suppose the role that white foreigners have in this country and our sort of uh, disparate reception um, for them, and and you know HSF and and you know there's a lot of baggage that potentially attaches to the Helen Sisman Foundation. This is not the place to go into it, but HSF has. Um, attracted huge amounts of, of criticism this last year for its work in respect of uh, ZDP. And yet the work that we've been doing in respect of an organization like Bain, which is a management consultancy organization headquartered in America, um, that has been shown both in the Nugent Commission and in the Zondo Commission to have been responsible for the capture of the South African revenue services, right, to the costs of the public interest and the most vulnerable in this country uh, who are dependent on public services in order to access education, healthcare, etc. That work going after um, an American headquartered institution has not been seen, none of the narrative around that is about, you know, these supposed foreign entities that have um, that have sought to engage in criminality in South Africa, it, it doesn't attach with the same sort of invective and extremism as it does in respect of you know ostensible criminality that is being committed by Z uh, Zimbabwe exemption permit holders. Even though in order to obtain those permits, they've actually had to. Um, on, uh, on a regular basis, obtain police clearances. Yeah. The, the, the issue of criminality doesn't arise. And I just hold that out as, um, as a demonstration, I think, of the um, differential treatment um, in yeah. the South African context. Um, thank you so much. One of you asked about stats on staffing at Fort Hare. Um, uh, uh, we have the stats for all 26 public universities over time. Um, and it, it, I have to say it's a very, very small percentage of African nationals from elsewhere are at all our universities. Obviously, ASOK will explain more at Fortis. So if you want that data, just email me or contact the ASOK office. Uh, I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Tabocha just to, to type in her email on the Q&A so that all of you can see it. If you want data on this stuff, we can give it to you. We have a book coming out next year that will in much more detail, obviously, um, give a fine-grained empirical sense of the state of this particular issue. Um, then one of you asked the question anonymous, uh, why do other countries like Zambia not build their own UCTs? I'm not going to entertain that question because I find it offensive. Um, that is no different from the MEC for Health in Limpopo asking a Zimbabwean patient uh, waiting for surgery, why don't you have your president in Zimbabwe sort out your problems? I find that so incredibly insensitive, so incredibly offensive to me as a South African that I'm not going to entertain it, but just to put a position on that. This forum is precisely to deal with our prejudices, our biases, uh, etc. And I also just want to say this, if I may, as a chair, um, I, I really appreciate that Sakele's 
uh, input about how he deals with what he calls a very fine balancing act and the reasoning that he shared with us. I appreciate that. But um, there's another reasoning, probably more fundamental, uh, and I'll come back to Sakele on this later. And that is, it's in the nature of a university not to discriminate. A university doesn't appoint its academics on a nativist policy, because if that happens, we might as well be a church or a mosque or a synagogue and select people on a declaration of faith or origins or, or that kind of nonsense. Uh, that we don't do enough of in our universities to say, what is a university for? It cannot be uh, to only hire people who look like us, who were born where we were born and that kind of thing. I want to ask uh, both Evans and um, Precious, in, uh, again, in that order, uh, one of the questions that came up, which is bewildering to many of us, is what do you think uh, are the causes of these xenophobic tendencies on our campus? Where is this coming from? Evans, you alluded to it a little bit, but speak a bit more. Why are we doing this? Why, why is it is a job insecurity? Is it, you know, the feeling that this government hasn't sorted out the problems of it's a part of the legacy, and now it's opening up to others. What do you think, uh, Evans? You've been in the system for a long time. Uh, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I mean, it's a mix of things. Uh, as I said, resentment is not uncommon uh, in society, particularly the wider society, beyond the academia. It's about the uh, contestation for resources, it's about uh, you know a resentment of encroachment of sorts, but I think what makes it so worrying in universities is the lack of leadership, such as Sakela as as he has shared with us. That you know you need to uh, to take first of all, I think in terms of uh, the development of staff you need to take a very kind of reasoned and principled approach. Realistic, but not giving way uh, to fancy in some ways. In other ways, uh, one of the best ways of doing it, which incidentally, uh, universities like the University of Zimbabwe, Zambia, and, and further field did, who is, who, who is to have a meaningful staff development program. Uh, and those, uh, programs did succeed. Uh, making uh, an academic is not an overnight thing, but it's happening. As Sakela said, there are people in the system. I have been fortunate uh, to be associated with the development of those people. So many reasons. Uh, the, if you take my experience, uh, there is a resentment on account of, uh, you know, personal kind of uh, uh, issues, but management leadership is also crucial. If you have got a, a line manager that greets you, uh, you know, says to to others, uh, for those who are naturalized South Africans, that you know these are foreigners traveling on South African passports. Needlessly, things like that. It's lack of 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 leadership. It's, it shouldn't be about that. So the resentment that comes out, in my view, is partly one of insecurity. You need to have uh, people, you know, in time it should disappear because if you uh, if you refer to Zimbabwe, Zambia, not alone, not, not, not least Kenya, this resentment was initially there until, uh, uh, until I think uh, uh, people got more and more secure by training their own. The, the tragedy is those people are outside. And why are they outside? Because they the educational systems, and you uh, yourself, Professor Janssen, has alluded to this, uh, the wider social political context has been mismanaged. And that's the tragedy. And my uh, and, and that, I think, is, is not unique in that sense. That, so what you, you find here is a, a reaction again against, you know, sort of uh, anything uh, that is different. And, uh, and the, the tendency to exclude people. This is the, uh, and, and, and I'm glad I, 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 uh, Sakela spoke about that, but you know, you gain nothing by excluding people. Right. And, yeah, that is, is, that's my take, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Precious, what do you think is going on? 
Um, I think um, Prof Kalule is um, spot on the issue of a competition towards um, scarce resources. And then in, in competition for that, and competition for vacancies is everywhere. It's common everywhere. But why then does it bring out this level of discriminatory and exclusionary practices? Is because then it is filtered through a country that is currently riddled with a particular history and certain narratives that are going on in South Africa, right? The history of South Africa as we know it um, cemented that certain types of academics field um, most of <clears throat> the universities. Of course, Forte, because of its um, historical past, Pan-Africanist um, history is quite different, but for many universities in South Africa, um, a lot of the posts were dominated by white and often male um, academics. So there is that history. And for those who are coming in and now competing, you're made to feel that um, <clears throat> now we are competing for the one or two posts and only this one can go to a black academic. And now let's make it a South African black academic. And so, um, vacancies now are being made to be filtered through those narratives now that are going on in the rest of South Africa, um, and which I think is quite unfortunate, which is very, very unfortunate. Because if you look at the statistics already, um, people from the narratives that you hear in broader society, you would think that at most universities, you are having a balance of maybe 50-50. Actually, with, in most universities, the ones with the highest foreign national component are as high as I think 25, 20%. Um, and that's a very small portion of um, the academic body, right? So if foreign nationals are not that many, why therefore is there this feeling of angst and unease and as if we are being hmm. overtaken? And, and I think those are narratives that are coming from the rest of the world, um, in the way that xenophobia has spread over from the Americas to Europe and also into South Africa. Right. And, that, and I think that's just now playing itself out in the academy. This feeling of um, they will take over, this feeling of we need to grow our own timber. Um, and this feeling of there is a fear of foreign nationals. And Nicole was talking about the issue of in wider society, there isn't a lot of data. Within the academy, we have the data. We know the contributions that foreign nationals are making within the academy in terms of teaching output units, in terms of supervision, in terms of publication. We have that. So we know the contributions. These are not freeloaders. So now we. this is where I think for me, activism and allyship are important because then we can challenge those narratives and to point them out as untrue because they are untrue. Hmm. I think Fantastic. that's yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I really appreciate two things that you mentioned. One is you can't understand this problem without a historical lens, and you can't understand it without a global lens because this is Trump's America is a very good example of this kind of meanness in relation to the foreigner. Um, okay, uh, Sakela, I'd like to give you the last word on this, and uh, one of the questions in the chat is. What are university leaderships doing about this problem? So we have heard what you do, and I appreciate that. But do these questions surface at USAF, the University of South Africa, which is the collection uh, point, the meeting point for vice chancellors of all the 26 public universities? Does this ever feature as an agenda item? Very much for the question, and, and indeed, and uh, it's a very uh, it's a very pertinent question in this dis discussion. It, it, the answer is the short answer is no. The, uh, the short answer is no. Yusuf, Yusuf is, a, is a body uh, may, uh, constituted by the vice chancellors of the twenty six uh, public universities in the country. And mm -hmm. um, as you probably know, though that structure and those universities amongst themselves are segmented amongst themselves. and um, and and one of the things that 
Yusuf never does, and for reasons which I, you know, I, I can't discuss here, is that it, it, for it to continue, you don't go into the histories. You don't go into the inequalities that we've inherited or the, 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 the benefit and, uh, and the privileges that we've inherited differently. And so once you, if you were to venture into this, Yusuf would probably fall apart. And um, so it's one of those no-go areas. And it's, I, I suppose it's because we as vice chancellors think differently about these issues. We manage our, our situations in our various institutions differently. And some of them, um, some of us, I suppose, uh, suppose would be terrified that if they touch this, it would bring, it would be their downfall in their home institutions. And, and so I, I, I think, I think there's, there's really, really that. Uh, so I cannot speak therefore for what each one is doing and the reasons they're doing it. And um, yeah, but, but it's basically one of those topics that never right. get discussed. Yeah. But, but, Thank you. Jay, Jay, yeah. but, but and I, I just wanted to make a, a completely different thing, but which makes the point about, about exclusion and who is considered an insider. Hmm. And as Forte speaks to this very quickly, and I'll say, there's a phrase that I discovered here when I landed here, which is uh, basically, uh, uh, it's son, it's, it translates into son of the soil or children of the soil. Abantu Now, umkuba is crawl, is crawl manure. So that, it, and the crawl is supposed to be the place where the wealth kind of, you know, uh, sits. So, so I, and then I try and try to understand this phrase. What it meant is that over time, remember Forte in 1959 was then made, was made an apartheid institution, was given over to the state under apartheid. And then in 1981, it was handed over to the Siskai Bandustan as a, as a Bandustan university. So everything reduced and reduced and reduced and we ended up with a Bandstein University and Bandstein people in bred academic cultures and all of those kinds of things. What then happens as democracy arrived, then this place had to become an, an, an international and a continental and a global institution. And so the resentment is not only of people coming from beyond the borders of the country. The, 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 the first the people who consider Bandu and Abongu are people from Alice and Surrounds. Hmm. People from the rest of the province, this side of the Kai River, they come second. That's the second layer. The people from across the Kai, they are viewed with great resentment. They're called Amatran Sky. And people suffer and people get traumatized because of this. And then the fourth and final layer is people beyond the province from other parts of the country. And finally, of course, then you have the foreign nationals. So you have this kind of segmentation and this yeah. socially created kind of system of exclusion and inclusion which are which we we having to kind of battle with and grapple with, and so it's oh. for us it's very very complex in that sense. But it it it, it takes uh, decisiveness, it takes a bit of courage, and it takes a bit of uh, going against the grain in a lot of time, a lot of the time. Thanks. What a beautiful conclusion. Um, I'm not going to ask you, uh, Professor Keller, which side of the Kai are you from. Don't 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 don't. Yes. Anyway. Yes, yes. Um, at the height of this conversation, we had about 150 people, uh, just short of 150 people on this uh, seminar. That's more than we've had, I think, uh, at any of the others. So clearly a topic that resonates with, with a lot of academic students and so on. Sorry, I couldn't get to all of the questions, but I tried to pick out the big ones. Uh, to um, uh, Ms. Fritz, to Dr. Simba, to Professor Kalula and Professor Bushlunga, thank you so much. You are treasured as colleagues, and you've really enriched this conversation beyond what I could have uh, imagined. To Dr. De Bochum Abota, thank you so much for managing and organizing uh, and ideating these presidential roundtables. I appreciate you uh, as a senior staff member at the Academy. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And uh, let us know if you need to have uh, either recordings or any other uh, information pertaining to this topic. Be blessed and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you so thank much, you. Prof. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. much. Thanks. Mm -hmm.